started gardening already. Those gardeners. We have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, gardeners see other gardeners and they can't help themselves. Sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. So we've got Jonathan from the Long Gully Community Garden. We've got Murray from the Suburban Food Garden. We've got Alyssa, who's going to be our soil expert today for Bendigo, our landscape designer. And we've got uh, Rowan, who's sitting in his tropical greenhouse and growing tropical fruits and things in Bendigo. So uh, first of all, I think we'll we'll just go in order um, and we'll ask everybody just to describe their, their gardens. Um, so Rowan, you're up first. Tell us about what you're doing in your backyard in North Bendigo. Hi. Yeah. Th thanks for having me. It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a pleasure actually. Yeah. Yeah. You can hear me all right. Everything's working. And, well. Yep. Excellent. Cool. Um, just so, would you would you mind recording this session? Yep. We are. Yep. Oh, so you are. Fine. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yep. I, I just think it might come handy down the track. You know, um, just with what I'm sort of doing at the moment with the Hort um, department in TAFE and etc. But anyway, um, so my, uh, I've only been here for four, four months in, in North Bendigo. Um, and in that time, I've um, basically just, uh, I don't know how to say it without really taking too long. Um, it was, a, it was a, a blank canvas, so to speak. Um, so I had a lot to play with. Um, so I started with just working with uh, where I could find the microclimates, the right spots. The whole yard gets full sun. Uh, it's very north facing, except for one cabbage palm that's very, very tall uh, in the neighbor's yard. I don't know why they have it, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> so, but um, yeah, yeah, so I, I'm still in the, very, in the, in the beginnings, but uh, I've got the greenhouse here um, that I'm in at the moment, which where I house my collection of rare tropical fruit trees. And um, I've yeah designated parts of the yard where I've already planted my bananas, uh, my pawpaws, the veggie garden, um, custard apples and uh, grapes, etc. So temperate, tropical, subtropical uh, sort of plants. So um, that that's what I'm doing. That that that's my thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Jonathan, tell us about the Long Gully Community Garden. Okay, well, if you've all seen the video, I can't really add much to it. But what I will say is that in the three or four months since we last spoke for that video, we've continued to grow, I guess, community input. So we've grown at the garden to now have a group that's built some wheelchair friendly raised beds so that people who have any level of ambulation, I guess is the word, can access soil and get their hands dirty. Um, we've grown the number of people from the Karen community who are involved now, up to 10 families. And we've grown the number of um, NDIS related groups from access employment to uh, independent options to about five or six of those groups. So the volunteer base is everything from people our age, retirees, sorry, <laughs> right through to um, some younger people who are doing their Cert 3 at Bendigo TAFE. Who are coming along and uh, realizing they can make mistakes on my fruit trees that a uh, professional what you just may not like them to do on their, their trees at Hawk Harcourt for example. Um, what we do is grow food for our mini pantry at the Long Gully Community House and we also put access into food share but more importantly I think we're trying to give our community the confidence and competence to go and do what we do in their backyards and front yards and medium strips and in their gorilla uh, backyards if they uh, want to go out and find a vacant block somewhere and we're not responsible. Um, so yeah, I, I just think that um, the community has been really welcoming of the garden. It, it wasn't being known about beyond the Long Gully Neighbourhood Centre for a couple of years. And um, while my predecessor was a good gardener, wasn't necessarily a good gabber. And uh, now that we do have that chance to spread the word, we've got people coming in from all over to have a look. Um, and probably what's really exciting for me is the master planning is continuing. We had, as Alyssa said, we've had the soil tests done. In our bare soil, it's about 600 times the recommended for safe soil in things. But the way my predecessors sit around it is that we've created um, raised garden beds with plastic sheeting between the soil and our growing medium. And then our orchard, which I'm really proud of, 26 fruit trees and about a dozen olive trees 
and a pistachio tree and a cedar, um, there's a felty membrane and it's about oh, 30 millimetres thick and apparently that also allows a transfer of moisture downwards but not necessarily um, contaminants upwards so we're quite confident that whatever we're feeding our community is not going to uh, make them sick. Um, and yeah, so through the year we've done things like collaborate with Old Church on the Hill and uh, different gardening groups that have a seedling swap. We'll do that again in January or February for the autumn planting. Um, we've been supported things like their seed swaps and we've had things like olive pickling or olive preserving workshops. We've had um, the modern, sorry, who's it? The central, the regional Victorians of colour group come in and have refugee barbecues there. And um, yeah, we're kind of just making sure that this is an open and welcoming place for everyone, whether they're gardeners, wannabe gardeners, or people who just like a nice spot to come for a stroll. So Jonathan, every day, would you have something in the pantry that people can access, that they can take home? And... Not necessarily fresh food. So Monday for me is harvest day, and we'll bring in whatever's on hand. The challenge is, um, I was watching, sorry, I have to remember which group it was. Um, I think it was Murray, wasn't it? Talking about growing in the uh, vegetables in the garden. We can't just grow out, encourage people to come and grab it because we're only open to the public on Mondays and Thursdays. So the stuff I grow needs to be, what's the word? Fresh for as long as possible. So things like recyclable plastic bags, um, spraying goods with produce with water, but normally it's all looking a bit sad by Thursday. And since the community house is only open from Monday to Thursday, whatever isn't taken is either taken by volunteers home to be used or sadly gets taken back to the garden to turn into compost. Um, but yeah, we use social media to get the word out. And when things that are very popular, pumpkins, for example, go super fast, um, people respond to that. And it's really nice when you see the shares going through the Long Gully neighbourhood that, you know, there's fresh fruit and vegetables from the garden at the at the neighbourhood centre. But the mini pantry also has some small amount of funding from various places to buy um, non-perishable goods as well. So yeah, there's, if people pop in, they should get at least a packet of pasta and a whatever, and hopefully a bunch of silver beet at the same time. Excellent. Now, Murray, we might um, ask you about your garden. In particular, there were a few plants in there that the CSIRO recommended uh, that not necessarily for here, but recommended. And um, yeah, so just tell us about your garden and some of the uh, different things you're growing. Well, um, when I first brought my place, uh, there was probably three or four established trees. Um, there was a walnut, an almond, um, a ornamental plum, and a great big Canary Island date palm, which is still there. Um, there was also a huge uh, camphor laurel tree, which basically covered about 90% of the block. It was huge. Um, I've since had that cut down um, and milled up and made some very nice furniture out of it. Thank you very much. Um, but uh, that enabled us to open up the sun to all our garden. For that one tree that we've gotten rid of, I've probably planted it about 30. Um, and everything in the backyard that I've done has been orientated towards edibles, um, either for me, the bees or the garden. Um, the camphor laurel, be just simply because of the amount of leaf litter that had dropped over, you know, the 50, 60, 70 years that it had been growing, um, nothing would grow underneath it. It was almost... Uh, sterile um, even like you'd pile up the leaves to decompose them and the bugs wouldn't live in them because it was camphor laurel and it's like camphor it keeps the bugs away um, so that was a real issue when I first moved in here so getting rid of that getting rid of all the leaf litter um, um, and introducing a lot of organic matter into the soil because it was hydrophobic um, and trying to just get trees established so that I can get a canopy um, at that stage, we were sort of in the middle of one of our droughts and it was really hot. Um, it was really hard to keep moisture in the soil and stop it becoming hydrophobic. Um, 
So it was all a matter of getting a canopy up and trying to um, get, as, get as much nutrients into that soil as possible to hold on to moisture. Um, so I've done a lot of um, plantings of uh, native edibles, uh, melon daisies, uh, the plum pines, um, lots of the herbs, the limes from the CSRO that you're talking about um, that they've developed, um, but mainly uh, just trying to have a good um, constant supply of picking greens every day, just so that we can walk out our back door and just pick, if not a meal, at least uh, additives to the meal or, or supplements to the meal um, and whatever fruits in season. Um, but for Bendigo, you know, like from 45 degrees to minus five, you've got to be very picky about what you plant and where you plant it and um, trying to establish those microclimates. So things might not, they might struggle a bit at first until you establish that canopy and that microclimate. Um, my whole philosophy is I try to um, just look at nature and what nature does, and that's the permaculture principle. Just, you know, nature's a great teacher. It teaches you about uh, the, the, the value of having humus on the ground and a microbiology within the soil um, keeping it shaded in summer and, you know, moist and trying to things, the things that are frost sensitive, making sure that they've got a little spot to survive in the winters. Um, it's a struggle and it's a challenge, but that's probably the, the thing I love about gardening the most is, you know, what can I grow there and how much food can that produce that little space? Mm. Okay. Um, in order to produce things, the soil needs to be right. So Alyssa, you might just give us a bit of a chat about yep. what we can do with our Bendigo clay soils and oh. the, the various soils and uh, yeah, oh. tell us. Yep. Okay, so I've tried to condense my talk. It was 10 minutes long originally. <laughs> I just can't help myself. Well, look, we'll um, give it some time, don't worry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'll just go through some sort of basic things and it's great. Thank you for like, um, yeah, Murray and Jonathan, what you've contributed so far, that's, that's yeah that's great about yeah protecting if you've got contaminated soil you know putting some plastic or something and then putting some new soil above that so that you're um, using that fresh soil rather than contaminated there's also plants that do a really good job of drawing out heavy metals out of your soil so like sunflowers for example are brilliant at um drawing out those heavy metals and changing the um I guess how toxic it is when, um, when you're exposed to it as well. They um, they change the compounds, which is amazing. Um, yeah, so I guess what if we go into the basics? So uh, I think Murray talked a little bit about the bi biota in the soil, the the microbes. So when we think about soil, it's not just you know dirt that might have a few bits of manure in it or a um, few minerals. It's actually healthy soil is a living ecosystem. We think about our native forests, it's like that, but underground and millions of biota that we can't, billions of biota that we can't even see most of them. So the ones that we can see um, that you might notice in healthy soil are things like worms, spiders, beetles, millipedes, slaters, um, and they're sort of the predatory type in the ecosystem. So they keep the smaller biota in check, keep everything balanced. And they also help a bit with breaking down organic matter in the soil. And uh, something else you might see in healthy soil is uh, the threads of white, uh, sort of almost like tiny like uh, roots, but smaller. <laughs> and they're the network of mycelium fungi and they're wonderful to have in your soil because they actually communicate uh, with all the different plants in the area that they are in and they transport nutrients around to different plants. Uh, they basically, they, they pick up if there's any sort of pathogens that have come in to the ecosystem and they, they alert all the plants about it and then the, the plants can put on their protective things that they do that protect them from those pathogens. Uh, so mycelium fungi, they're wonderful. Um, the sort of the minute things that we can't see are things like bacteria, 
um, archaea, viruses, fungi, smaller fungi, protists, nematodes, the list goes on. So there's quite a lot of things going on under our feet that we don't even realize. It's quite amazing. Uh, and just to give an example of why these things are so helpful to our plants, for example, there's a type of um, fungi called AMF, short for endoarbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. That's why we say AMF, because it's easier <laughs> to remember. Um, and they basically, when they're attached to the roots of a plant, they can, so normally the root system of a plant can access basically just what they can reach within their root system, the nutrients and the water from just what they can reach with their roots. So for a, a tomato, it might be, I don't know, they only have about 60 centimetre roots or even less, so just within that sort of range. But if there is this type of fungi living in harmony on the roots of that plant, it can access 40 times the size of that root area for water and nutrients. So it's massive what, what the fungi can do for your plants. Um, and another, another cool fact, which um, I hope I'm not bringing up anything too sensitive to anyone, but the floods that we've been seeing lately, um, the um, healthy soil can actually absorb over 70 mil of water an hour. So if you think about the sort of rainfall that we were getting recently that caused a lot of flooding, if we do, you know, 24 hours, 70 mil an hour, that's quite a lot of water that, that a healthy soil is basically a sponge that can just hold all of that water. It doesn't wash away. Um, it, it soaks down eventually into groundwater. Uh, so it's actually, yeah, quite, um, yeah, quite important that we think about our soils because they, if, they're, if the water is running off and not soaking in, it's causing a lot of issues with flooding. Um, our watersheds are under much more pressure. Um, yeah, so. So Alyssa, you might just um, talk about breaking down the clay soil in Bendigo so we can. Mm. Yep, yep, so yeah, a lot of people have clay soil, yep. Uh, so you wanna be encouraging uh, all the biota in your soil to do a lot of the work of breaking up that. So, so worms, for example, they burrow down, they make holes in your soil for air and nutrients and water to travel through. Um, also plants that have a taproot are very useful. So even something you see commonly as a weed, uh, dandelions, they have a big taproot they're actually helping your soil. If you've got clay soil, they're actually, that taproot is reaching down deep into the soil, creating, breaking up your soil for you, getting nutrients from deep in the soil and bringing them up. So if you see dandelions, don't necessarily pull them out. They might actually be helping your soil. <laughs> There's a, yeah, so yeah, deep taproot sort of things. And when that taproot breaks down, it actually, it leaves that pathway open in your soil. Um, yeah, so generally I don't encourage tilling too much. It might be good as an initial thing if you're going to just loosen up the soil initially and then cover it over with organic matter um, and don't touch it again after that. Can I add something to yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of not tilling, right? Mm -hmm. um, the forest never gets tilled apart yeah. from the animals that are in there and digging up and doing it. The, the, the idea is to build up those levels, build up those layers of humus, build up that binome within the soil um, and let them do the work for you. I'm a big fan of being a lazy gardener. Yep, me too. Um, it shouldn't be a lot of work, you know. If, if you follow nature's rules and in nature's rules, they nature hates bare soil. Okay, hates it with a vengeance. It'll put weeds there, it'll grow anything it can in that soil to try and make it not bare. Okay, and once those weeds establish in permaculture, weeds are better than bare soil. So if you've got a garden that you can't get to in a while, let it go fallow, let the weeds go crazy. And let it, you know, I mean, as long as it's not something like buffalo grass or cooch grass that's going to impreg, you know, make the soil impenetrable and stuff, if it's something that can easily be pulled out in winter when the soil's moist, um, that's fine. But yeah, don't till the soil, build up on top, 
um, let them do the let the, that binome do the activity for you. Um, and the importance of the hydrology and managing your hydrology on your block is incredibly important. I've got a drop of seven meters from one corner to the other diagonal corner on my block. Before I moved in, the water would pour down and it would literally just wash all my topsoil away. Um, since coming in and establishing drains that drain into beds, uh, swales in the ground to capture moisture to slow it down and let it soak into the beds, um, water management uh, into that humus layer and keeping it moist so that they can do their thing. Um, all incredibly important, especially in Bendigo summers, because um, we don't get a lot of rain, but when we do, we want to capture it and slow it down and stop it rushing away and mm. put it into our beds so that they can um, you know, keep everything alive, basically. So swales, um, managing your hydrology and humus on top is my big thing. Mm. Yep, I couldn't have said it better. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> That's all right. I'm Straight totally agreeing with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, might just, we might just move on to Rowan again and just ask how he, um, what he does with his soil to grow the tropical plants. And how, how, I mean, how, how do you grow a pawpaw in the backyard in Bendigo, et cetera? Yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting that you say that, Liz, because um, uh, with the floods that we just had, I, I believe that uh, my pawpaw in the ground has uh, suffered a little bit from, you know, all the rain that just... Um, I actually, for the first time ever, had to repel water from rain getting into a plant. I just put cardboard around it so it would just, I don't know, sort of just that heaviness drains off because the issue is that that sort of plant... Uh, is used to a wet season environment. But however, Benigo isn't a tropical environment, so you can't rely on the heavy rain um, in a flooding sense like that with a, with a plant like that in Victoria. And even up in Cairns, when I was working up in there and dealing with a lot of tropicals, um, we still had to tell people that even in the wet season, you need to water, you still need to water your plants because people thought that, oh, well, it's the wet season, the rain comes, you know, the, the plants get what they want. So um, those plants up there don't get as, uh, not such a, a, a sudden flood like, like what happens down here. So I think that that plant is struggling a little bit, uh, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, uh, so, um, but with the soil, in regards to the soil here, I've actually been quite lucky. Uh, and, you know, I won't, I won't go too, too much into it because um, there's some soil experts here and I'm trying to learn as much as I can from them. Uh, it, I, I have been very, very lucky, even at the point where I think, like, um, if you do hear magpies uh, just bombarding the, the sound around me, it's because I was doing some digging this morning and there's so many worms and they've all just swooped down and th there's like a gang of them that just, yeah, obliterate everything that I do here, but um, including, uh, you know, when you try and eat a nice lunch of fish and chips, they, they, they <laughs> swarm you, you know. <laughs> they don't leave anything untouched. Um, but uh, look, yeah, basically what I'm saying is that we, we've been pretty lucky in the sense that I think a lot of the garden in previous years uh, had been worked with and prepped and I think there was a garden so the soil is actually not too bad um, there's only a few areas that I've really had to battle with clay uh, so you know I, I'm really sort of doing the whole dig as far down as I can uh, until I just can't dig anymore and maybe gypsum you know gyps, gypsum the buggery out of it and then sort of and then combine my soils that I think are okay with my own compost and with yeah as much organic matter as possible um uh the other thing too is that uh just like i said in 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 the previous garden that i had uh where, where liz was filming me which some of you might have seen um i don't live there anymore that was just a rental um but but here i've really had to work the soil uh, a lot so I've, I've been learning a lot of things uh, which is yeah why i'm very um interested to hear what Alyssa has to say and, and even, um, you know, Murray in his experiences uh, too. So look, I, I'm learning. And I, you know, we've got, we've got some questions about your greenhouse. Oh yes. Yes. Um, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, it looks like Perspex to me. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the greenhouse. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do get asked a lot of questions about it. Um, 
So the, basically the reason why I, I said sprout well is because they design greenhouses for gardeners, gardeners of all, all levels. So whether you just want to protect um, your veggies or your plants through the winter, like just from frost, you can get, you know, a very, like, like, <laughs> like I said, the, the greenhouse um, uh, variety, like the greenhouse range, that's just for rich people to sit back and say, yeah, yes, uh, look what I have, you know, and that, that it's really not practical, you know. I mean, I'm sure like the, the polycarbonate retains heat a lot better. Um, it's, it's more durable, it's flexible. Uh, so yeah, basically they, that, that brand, they create greenhouses for, for, for a client, for clients that they know are gardeners or amateur horticulturists or amateur uh, growers, which is why I went with them. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's a polycarbonate uh, 10 mil that I've got um, and, and it does the job perfectly. I mean, and look, and I feel a little bit ashamed because it's not entirely sustainable, but I keep it as sustainable as I can. But realistically, I've got so many rare, very, very rare species of tropical plants in here. I, I can't really do anything else. I've spent the last four years um, growing them without this kind of environment and had, you know, have done the best I can. Uh, but this is really, really top thing. So, I mean, you can go to my level with a greenhouse like this, where you're growing, I know I've got, if I look now, there's mangoes, there's custard apples, uh, uh, Brazilian custard, a star apple. There's even a durian behind me. I've got durian here. Uh, there's a coconut, dwarf Malay coconut there. So all that sort of stuff. Otherwise, um, I've known people to just basically build a raised garden bed and grow tomatoes and capsicums and eggplants through the winter. Um, so it's really up to you what you do with this sort of greenhouse because they're designed, and I don't have any affiliation with Sproutwell. Um, I just know that they're the, they're the guys that make greenhouses for gardeners who take their either propagation or uh, edible produce seriously that live in really crappy climates, yeah. So Jonathan, are there any greenhouses at Long Gully? Yeah, so I, I inherited from my predecessor a lean-to greenhouse and we were fortunate that um, through a contact they got some um, ex-commercial poly, the uh, just plastic for the thing, and that is vulnerable to kids throwing rocks and vulnerable to hail, but we've got enough to basically repair it with patches of um, extra plastic and silicon, so uh, we'll keep going for a few more years with that yet. Um, one thing I'm learning is that any kind of plastic which is not perfectly clear loses energy. So I'm finding that although it gets a lot of sunlight, I sense that just for the way that, say, for example, you grow a broccoli seedling and the growth between nodes is meant to be quite short, they're shooting up about that high just on the cotyledons. Can you, oh, sorry, can you see that? Oh, where's the camera? That's and it. so I'm just thinking that I need to be acutely aware of the fact that maybe there's might need to revisit the kind of greenhouse we've got. Um, we have a problem that inside the greenhouse in summer, it gets up to about 55 degrees. So we're working with uh, an Access Australia group to put in some, call them storm windows. So there'll be poly for winter and shade cloth for summer to get some air flowing through the house. Um, but I also need to investigate whether or not there might be a better medium to replace that plastic with because maybe it's getting old and cloudy but you know without the proper light energy hitting the plants whether they're warm or cold it doesn't matter they're not growing as well as they could be oh and the other big challenge is it's a long way from a tap and with people there only twice a week we get to the stage where i've been looking for someone to help me extend a um, irrigation pipe up there so i can put in a misting system funding hasn't come through so I think I'm going to have to invest in like a 50 meter hose and just run it along the ground but um, I'll have to start misting those plants well from about now right through summer just to make sure they're still alive. You can get some really high tech things that uh, open and close as the heat to try to maintain the heat as well um, so I don't know how you warm it up in winter though how do you warm it up do you have your compost in there because compost generates a lot of heat and it's, you can actually heat your glass house with your compost. It's not quite that large. Um, it's actually warm enough to get reasonably good germination just from natural light through winter. Um, mm. It's quite ventilation proof. 
which is why I'm thinking if we can get that shade cloth in summer, yeah. as you say, I could, I could, if I had the funds, create yeah. some lovely louvers on the ceilings and, and all that stuff. Um, all the ones we had at uni were like that. You just sort of, yeah. you know, two inch gap, three inch gap. But um, this one, we just opened the door and opened the windows yeah. basically. <laughs> Yeah, rudimentary. <laughs> the best way um, to do it. It is like, um, like with the, with this model, they they suggested installing uh, windows that open as as it gets hotter. Mm -hmm. But for me, I need the heat and I need the humidity. Like so, I uh, dismiss those, and I just rely on um, yeah the windows. You know, so you can adjust um, how high the windows go up. So I rarely. I, I'm assuming that in the middle of I don't know January. I probably keep the doors open, have the windows up high because, um, in in past experiences when I just had the really basic greenhouse, like the the um, you know, obviously I won't say the uh, the the large uh, um, hardware store chain that dominates you know two parts of this town, but you know they sell the the big you know the the, the real plastic ones, and I was growing tropicals fine in that uh, in summer, but winter just couldn't retain the heat, and yeah. that's the difference. And you need to look at greenhouses as uh, something that is going to provide you idealistic growing conditions in winter because mm. summer really isn't a problem. Mm. Uh, everything will thrive in, in summer, particularly like the last one we had with all the rain. Mm. Um, you know, I really, like my job was half done. So yeah, you always think of a greenhouse as, as something to get you through winter if you want to push through with things, like if you're, if you're not a seasonal gardener, so to speak. And um yeah, and, and in Bendigo, it is very seasonal. Like Melbourne, they, yeah. they have the advantage because it's Concrete Canyon, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but here it's very open. Um, but look, you can get in, sorry, I, I, I won't dominate with, you know, I know I just interrupted, I'm sorry about that, but uh, we, we, you can get polycarbonate that um, ref, uh, is double-sided. So there's a light side that brings in the light and uh, provides your, you know, your, the appropriate UVs, but it's not a direct uh, entrance of light. It sort of has a reflective back panel that sort of filters it enough. So uh, a lot of the tropicals are growing here are, are shade under under uh, understory plants. Um, I've only just put the shade cloth on now, uh, but, but previously to that, they were doing fine with the with the full sun hitting it, just because it had that barrier behind it. Mm. So yeah. Yeah. So Kay's actually put in that interesting comment about um, do you need a greenhouse or do you need a something that's just there to get an early start on your spring and summer vegetables? And we have used the plastic storage boxes with a, a, a see-through lid to just get that germination going. Yeah. And I also like lidded seedling containers because it will just stop all those, I don't know what is eating my seedlings, whether it's rats or mice, or whether it's a slug that doesn't leave a trail, but I'm losing 60% of my seedlings by something that goes through, it looks like it's just a lumberjack, <laughs> chops them off beautifully. And it's really frustrating, but um, someone suggested even those little seedling trays you buy with a plastic lid is enough yeah. to get that bit of extra heat in August to get everything going earlier than usual. Mm. Yeah, because in Bendigo, we don't plant our tomatoes till Melbourne Cup Day. That's right. <laughs> um, Unless Murray, you're an you... optimist. <laughs> Murray, you've got um, some veggie pods, haven't you? So tell us about the success of those in your garden. Yeah, I thought I'd give them a go. I brought one um, mainly because uh, when the dogs come to visit, they do a lot of wheeze on our green stuff. So I, I just wanted to make sure we had some good green pickables that the dogs weren't getting on and they didn't have bugs and slugs in them. So my, my like, I know a lot of people have garden beds and they plant everything in straight lines and they rotate their crops and all that. I, I don't do any of that. I've got to tell you, I just plant everything incredibly densely as if it's a forest and I mix everything up. Um, some things do really well, some things don't. Um, as some things grow and die off, the other things take over. Um, and it's great just watching it all happen. And because it's so dense, um, in summer, the sun really doesn't get to the ground to dry it out. Um, and if, if you're growing it like that, you're able to go out and just pick it all the time whenever you want. 
Um, but as I said, a lot of the green leafies were getting just sort of buried amongst the bigger stuff. So I thought I'd get one of these um, veggie pods and just try them. It's been reasonably successful. I put imported soil in it, not my soil from the garden. So I look at how they grow in my garden, how they look in my soil. And I think it's just a matter of I've got to improve the soil because the commercial stuff you buy just is it's, it's almost sterile, you know. Mm. It, 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 it's a growing medium, but it's got no life in it at all. And if there, if there was ever a proof to me that you need soil that's alive and not just a growing medium that you plant things in and fertilise, um, yeah, this has been it, really. So... Yeah, so it's Alicia, been reasonably successful, but I have to, you have to make sure you've got good soil in them, that's yeah. all. Alyssa, it's, that is, isn't it? the commercial soils that you buy are often yeah. heat treated to get rid of yeah. bad seeds and things like oh, that. So yeah. you're basically getting a mineral content, That's right. maybe a bit of organic, but actually alive things, I guess you have to add. So Murray, yeah. are you just transferring some of your humus layer to that? To well, what I do is I tend, to, I tend to, I've got chooks down the back there. I don't actually have a compost bin or, or anything like that. Um, everything that I've got either goes to the uh, chooks and they eat it or it rots down in the chook pen. So over the time with uh, additives and straw and things that I put in the chook pen, they, they build up inside their run. They build up a really nice layer of broken down chook manure and organic matter. And that's basically what I'm feeding my gardens with. I might be able to get maybe half a dozen barrows out every year of really good, stinky, you know, stuff that's going to, you know, what's that poem? Out of such noxious stench, such sweetness grows. Um, and just put it into the garden. And I don't mean, um, you know, dig a hole and plant it. I mean, just break it up, spread it around the garden, turn it, turn the top humus so it's mixed in with the humus so everything can bring it into the soil um, and just keep improving it like that. Um, and again, anything I cut off, any, any vegetables that I can't use, any waste from them just gets dug straight back into the garden. Any prunings from the tree, I put through my mulcher and mulch the garden. So trying not to take any organic matter out of your garden, trying to just put it all the way back in. It's all part of that carbon capture, putting carbon in your soil so that it can be alive. And uh, only live soil will give you good live food as far as I'm concerned. I, I really worry about um, the mass production of food uh, for me, is it, it, a lot of a lot of them aren't farmers, especially the corporate farms. They're they're uh, miners. They mine our soil. They don't put anything back in. All they do is till it, uh, fertilize it, grow this stuff, and put it all. And the 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 nutrient content of the food is governed by what nutrients are in the soil that it's growing from. Um, and for me, it's just having that access to live food every day um and i think that's been well it's certainly been good for me and my family over the years and like in this time when everyone's talking about uh food insecurity and uh you know supply lines and all this sort of stuff then just be happy with what you can grow in your backyard at that particular time of the year and what's available at that time of the year. And you can actually get through and you really appreciate it. You know, you might not be able to get a mandarin uh, 12 months of the year, but you really enjoy them when they come along. And if you're eating a mandarin or an orange that's from California, that's months old, that's not food. Okay. Go and eat what's in season in your backyard. <laughs> Um, Alyssa, I might bring you in there. Just uh, Murray talked about mulch. Um, mm, yeah. Yeah. What, what yeah. makes a good mulch and um, yeah. you mulch yeah. your weeds? Because Ross is wanting to know. I've also got mulch? a question for Alyssa um, after this question as well, too. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry, what, did, what was the question Ross had? Oh, just uh, what do you do with weeds? Can you compost oh. them? Okay, so mulch first. So my favorite mulch is actually arborist mulch. It's the cheapest mulch you can get. It's what uh, all those uh, big companies that chop prune the trees on the roadside, um, chop down any trees in someone's backyard. They just get this collection of real diversity. It might be pine, it might be eucalypt, sticks, leaves, bark, 
all thrown in together. And I love that, not just because it's cheap, um, but because it rots down really quickly and builds good soil. Uh, so, I mean, depending what you want the mulch for, if you want mulch that's going to last for years, just get like the wood chip type mulch. But if you want mulch that's going to build soil and build that diversity in your soil, yeah, Arborist mulch is awesome for that. It's got such, it comes from a diverse source. So, yeah. Um, also, you know, Pistro, I use Pistro in my veggie garden. I think that's great. It rots down even quicker than Arborist mulch. more peas. <laughs> yeah, and I oh we got a great um harvest of free peas. Yeah, well, um, the ones I <laughs> the, yeah <laughs> the ones I planted in the garden by hand didn't grow peas, but mm. the ones that came up from the pea store did. That's so. right. <laughs> um yeah, so pea store's good. Um yeah, yeah, they're probably my favorites. Um Ross's question, weeds, can you what was it? Can you, can you compost them? Can you compost them? For sure. Yep. You just have to make sure that it's a hot compost um, because you don't want them re like growing and regerminating. Um, yeah, so with a hot compost, you have to make sure that you've got the good carbon and nitrogen ratios. I think it's 30 to one, is that right? <laughs> I don't actually do a compost pile. I'm lazy, so I do sheet mulching, which is composting in place. So actually on my garden beds, I just I just layer up there. Um, so I'm not an expert on actual hot compost. As far as weeds are concerned, chooks love them. Okay, oh. so if you've got a couple of chooks, just feed them to the chooks, they'll turn it into compost for you. Um, and if they, if you haven't got chooks, you can compost any weed. You just bury it in the ground. It'll it'll compost and rot down. Do it before there's seed. One year's seed, seven years weed. Okay, mm. so if you can get things before they seed, tear them out, bury them in the ground, let them rot down. The only thing that goes in my green waste bin is cooch grass and rose clippings because I've got an old cottage. There's a few rose pushes out here. My wife won't let me get rid of, and I don't want to, don't want to put them in the garden because you get old rose thorns entering your hands and stuff so but cooch grass buffalo grass by all means don't try to compost it throw it in the green bin get rid of it um, but everything else can rot the only other plant i'd do that to murray is sour grass sour sob yeah just, um, got a love hate relationship with that stuff tell me about the love bit oh uh, look it, it's it's easy to pull out of the ground and it sort of gives a coverage over the place that sort of you know the soil can it, it's good for soil going fallow when you're letting something go fallow and actually before it flowers they say that if you pull it out of the ground before it flowers it stops the bulb from developing again so i've been going on that principle where i'll and the bees like them so i've got like i've I've hated it for so many decades that I've given up and I've just and I've just got to have to accept that this stuff's going to keep coming up in my garden and everywhere else. Um, and it's what I can do with it and how I can minimize it and how I can crowd it out of my garden. Um, because there's a lot of competition in my garden. You know? yeah. yeah, can I? I oh, sorry, you go. Yeah. I, I was just going to say I had a talk back gardener once say the only way to get rid of oxalis in your garden is to move house. Yes, yeah, I yeah. heard that. I'll, I'll start eating it. <laughs> if your soil is not contaminated, then just... yeah, well, that's <laughs> yeah. True. check that first. Um, with south, um, so south sob, um, yeah. yeah, we've got it all over our yard. Um, yeah. It, yeah, the the best way I found is to outcompete it. That's so right. In, and when it grows, our competitor in its growing season, so that's the winter months. Yeah. So natives, if you can grow some dense natives that block out all the light. Uh, so for example, I've got couriers all along our house. Mm. Um, it's a quite shady. Yeah, just something dense with stringers that will just, yeah, outcompete it with the roots and blocking the light. That's the only thing I found it. Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, we might. Uh, Rowan, what was your question for Alyssa? Question was just um, and uh, well, you can add to this too, um, Alyssa or, or Murray or anyone. Um, I've actually been lucky. I, I don't have sour sob oxalis here. I, I'm I've just got to deal with the bloody cape weed. Yeah, like it's oh. it's just everywhere, and you know we're digging it up, but 
my question um, was for Alyssa, like, um, what would be your approach or, or your, you know, sort of theory on uh, creating a, uh, having a raised garden bed um, in, in indoors or, or um, not, when I say indoors, like in a greenhouse or, or outdoors, like sort of a, you know, a, you're not dealing with actual soil. Um, what would be your uh, theory on creating a uh, a soil in that um, in that tub, like a wicking bed that that replicates real soil in the ground? Okay. Yep. So it's completely separate from the soil. It's in a container of some sort. That's right. Yeah. So there's, yep. Yeah. Like um, you know, you've obviously got pot culture, which is just potty mix and yep. and, and whatever. And then um, yeah. So like, how, how would you go about like how can I replicate the 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 you know the the cation exchange sort of thing that goes on in the ground in a, a raised oh. uh, bed or or a pot. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So um, it is challenging. Any sort of raised bed, it's because it's such a small size. If you compare it to the vast amount of soil that's in the earth that plants have access to, it's always going to be a lot more work. So you're going to have to be putting inputs into it constantly mm. to keep it alive and keep it mm. the plant, like the soil fed and um, healthy and balanced. So yeah, it's always going to be more work. So you've got to know that up front. It depends really what you're growing in it. So if you're growing, say, a tree, uh, I don't know, think of our avocado we've got in a container. You don't, you want the soil to be the level you want it when you plant the tree and you don't want it sinking over time. So in that sense, you probably want to put, bring in some sort of soil mix and then repair that. So um, yeah, wh wherever you're getting that from, you need to be adding lots of organic matter, mulch, um, worm castings, um, making sure the pH is right and constantly checking those things. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's that. But, but for example, if you were planting annual things that you're going to say a tomato plant that you're just going to grow for a season and then, um, yeah, you can keep topping up the soil with and it doesn't matter if it rots down for that kind of thing you can definitely just do like the lasagna gardening type thing where you uh, there's lots of different ways you can do it um for example in our raised beds where we've got our veggies i just got a whole heap of fresh horse manure and then pea straw horse manure pea straw and just layer it up you can add whatever organic matter you want newspapers um yeah, worm castings, whatever, um, and just layer it up, all this variety of stuff. And then it's basically a compost heap. And you might want to wait a month or so because it's quite hot initially before you plant into it and then make some pockets, put some compost in there, plant in your tomatoes. That'll thrive for that season and then it'll, it will eventually go down and then you'll just need to add a few more layers before you plant your next crop. So that's another option, yeah. And biodynamic lifters, all uh, that, yeah. Increasing just your basically work. because I, I, um, you know, I've got like a, a raised bed in the greenhouse that that has, um, it's the spice garden, and I started initially with very basic um, sort of soil, but I, I've been, yeah, adding the worm castings, adding manures, adding basically uh, things that weren't. Um, you know, more, more, more organic matter like that you could get from a garden, like and, and and you know compost, home compost and stuff. Yeah, like you know. Nice. And I, I was sort of wondering if that is, uh, you know, a deadly combination of, of sort of turning uh, something that started off initially as not just potting mix, but yeah, uh, kind of creating that raised bed uh, from a very um, standard store bought sort of uh, like your zoo grow and that that sort of stuff um mm. and then really building up on the matter of it I, I, yeah no i think yeah. that's great what you've been doing yeah that it makes sense you've got to yeah. you've got to bring it to life again anything that you're buying in pretty much 
Yep. Yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, yep. awesome. Okay. And, no, and no worries. <clears throat> Um, in our last session, we had um, Rianwen and Andrew from Mackenzie Quarters, and they are composting all their food waste. Oh. Um, and we may be able to help you out by getting some of that. So, mm. yeah, only exclusively for sustainable house days, I think. Otherwise, they'll have a queue out the door every day. <laughs> yeah. Liz, Damien's um, asked a question I'd like to answer if I can, please. Yeah. Um, Damien, that's my speciality. I've been a builder for 40 years. And I've also been a keen gardener. Um, and basically, I've tried to, whenever I've done a house, designed a house, or built a house for an architect, incorporated the garden into complementing the building and the building complementing the garden. Now, I don't think there's uh, any separation of the two in, in my mind. Um, most of the houses I've done out in Mandurang and Sedgwick and stuff over the years have had uh, composting worm farms uh, for their wastewater uh, pumped out to irrigation beds, certainly utilised a lot of the uh, um, tree surgeons uh, mulchings and everything that were talked about before by Lisa. We've got um, uh, systems that uh, can put out water that's almost clean enough to drink, although you probably wouldn't. Um, I, I had uh, great run-ins and issues with the health inspector for council because of that, uh, you know, you'd have to plant particular plants around the house uh, being fed by those systems, um, but I've yet to find anything that says that E. coli can travel up a tree and into a piece of fruit that you eat it if it's being uh, irrigated. Uh, underneath the mulch with a drip irrigation system. Maybe if it was being sprayed over the tree, but it's not. If, if you have the right systems, you can utilize all that gray water. As far as keeping your houses cool in summer uh, and allowing the winter sun to get in in winter, um, my personal experience is, is to utilize the grape. There's some really nice grapes out there and the grapevines are just brilliant. They grow really quick, so easy to train. Um, you prune them right back in, in um, winter, so they let all the winter sun in. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that, Murray. Um, at McDonald's Nursery, their main shade house yep. for all their um, plants that, 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 that we, uh, we used to, uh, that they grow on, yep. um, the main shade and canopy for that is just a huge grapevine. Yeah, and like even if you don't get to eat them all, the birds love them. I keep that many birds alive out of my garden and rats at the moment, it seems. They, they love my garden. Um, so it, it's a matter of, uh, for me, it's always been a matter of edible landscaping. So if I'm putting uh, trees in to cast shade, it'll be a deciduous tree. Um, you know, there's plums, there's apples, there's stone fruits. Um, our biggest issue, I suppose, at the moment with the changing climate is uh, um, the, the fruit flies coming in because of the humidity and the weather. Um, they've, they've probably been the bane of my life over the last few years. Um, oh, but, but just got a, we've just got to ask about fruit fly, Murray. Yeah. But, um, but there is a recipe for, have you got the recipe? Yeah, for... I use the, I use the uh, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Yep. Uh, the water and a bit of um, detergent in them and I put them into the baits and hang them around the trees um, and because it smells like rotting fruit they come from miles and miles around. I've managed to get, if you're lucky, you can sort of get some fruit and some years are better than the others but I, 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 I long for the days when we had uh, fruit fly drop-off bins at the border and stuff. I don't know why we ever stopped that um, but it, it's an issue that we have to deal with constantly now. Um, like even, I don't even grow the big juicy tomatoes anymore that Bendigo's are famous for. I grow the little ones because they're ready to eat quick enough that the fruit flies won't get into them anymore. So I'm having to adapt uh, my growing and adapt my uh, food uh, according to what pests are around and trying to keep them out. Um, but uh, as far as shading around your house, um, if, if you've got enough room to plant trees, if you're worried about, uh, you know, eventual movement of, um, um, you know, foundations and things like that, most of the fruit trees uh, have got a fairly shallow root system with a big tap. Orange trees have a, a surface root system. Um, so, yeah, you, you're unlimited, really. I mean, just, just make sure. For me, I've killed a lot of plants. 
okay, as a gardener. As a gardener, you should be proud of the fact that you've actually killed a lot of plants um, because it means you're giving things a go and you're trying things out and you're trying that position and you're trying to make sure that you can get it to grow in that position. That's always the challenge for me is trying to find a, um, a little microclimate that this thing will do well in. Um, and sometimes you succeed and sometimes you don't. And you learn more from what you don't than you do. So um, I've learned a lot over the years. Um, and so most of the houses I do um, incorporate grapevines, uh, um, tr trellis and balustrades, um, making sure you've got trees that are gonna grow to a fairly substantial height and cast a lot of shade in summer and make what's the northerly aspect of a house would bake in summer, make sure that it's gonna be nice and cool there in summer, a nice shady spot to hang out. Um, you're only really limited to your imagination um, ab about that. But for me, it's always been edibles, always plant edibles. Uh, to me, a, uh, a, a real Josephine pear tree is just as beautiful and you can eat the fruit as an ornamental pear tree. Um, a, an ornamental plum uh, is, is not as good as a real blood plum tree. And they're just as beautiful, um, more so, because they have the beautiful fruit on them for months of the year as well. Um, so yeah, just, just go for it, try things. My, my best advice is just try things. If they don't work, if they don't flourish in an area, or it might be because of the soil or the nutrients or the pH level, um, just give it a go. And um, just always work on your soil. Just always add stuff to the soil. The soil needs feeding just as much as you do. And if you feed it, it'll feed you. Um, food's free, just plant it. <laughs> you know, it's like that's a great philosophical place to end, actually, because we're, we're kind of out of time. But I just wanted to address the fruit fly. Um, and we may put a message or a recipe up on our, um, our Facebook page at some stage, because uh, I know Ken, Ken, I was just asking him to put his recipe in, but I know he uses cider vinegar as well. Yeah. Um, Jonathan, are you addressing fruit fly? Okay. In our orchard... Um the only way to really manage it will be exclusion. Yes. So I'm hoping to put in fruit fly netting this year if I can afford it. Mm. Um, bait, baiting does an okay job, but you'll always have to share your fruit with fruit fly. Mm. Um, and talking to some commercial growers, they, they're the same opinion. You either spray the heck out of it so it's poisonous yeah. or you um, exclude. And when you're talking about, say, our 26 fruit trees will take about $30,000 to build a commercial cage. Yeah. We're not doing that, no. um, but that's the kind of expense that our commercial fruit growers are going to. Um, I don't know, Murray, whether or not your philosophy of mix and match means that you're creating a much more aggressive insect ecosystem. Absolutely. Where maybe the fruit flies are actually yeah. getting not just trapped, but also eaten by a few of your Absolutely. predatory insects as yeah. well. The more yeah. diverse your forest is, the, the more predators that live there, the more birds that come in. There's all of those benefits. And my whole thing is to... You know, if, if always produce more than what you need, you always will. Like like once you've got it up and going in a permaculture backyard, it it, it takes over. It's, it gets its own life. It just becomes this thing that just evolves and gets bigger and bigger. And um, mainly, what I do nowadays is prune and harvest. Um, uh, because it's small, I try to keep my trees managed to the point where they're not out gunning each other and everything, and try to keep the canopy level as it's growing up. Um, and all of those things and try to plant understories when I've got an understory um, and ground covers when I've got a ground cover and you just basically build a forest. Um, and if you've got a forest ecosystem as opposed to a standalone tree in a paddock or a whole paddock of standalone trees uh, that, that are all the same, you're creating the perfect environment for, for, for the, the pest to come in and, and wreak havoc and have a field day. So the more diverse it is, the better. Um, uh, better for you, better for the environment, better for the, the, the garden and the produce that you get off, but always produce more than you need. I'm, I'm sharing everything I grow with the birds the, you know, and any animals that come in. Um, and whenever people drop in, everyone goes home with a basket or something freshly picked or, 
and, and get to know other people that are doing the same. So if you've got an abundance of one thing in a particular time, you can swap and share. And um, my wife, uh, uh, Kelly, for some time ran the Bendigo Food is Free thing where she organised everyone that was growing and we used to put it on the table at the park and, and just share it. Everyone would come every morning and do that. Fortunately, the council jumped on that and sort of that's said okay. we've, we've got food share we can donate to but that's now. what i mean there's other there's other things that are up and running now that that, that you can tap into um and uh you know it, it's just vastly better for you vastly better for your garden i i have people coming to me go oh you must spend so much time working on your garden well no i don't i really don't um I, picking and pruning every now and again and pulling the odd weed is what I do. I look at people across the road with their boxed hedges and their huge expanses of lawn and, you know, they're there every weekend, labouring away, mowing and snipping and trimming and um, using yes. fire resources yes. to do it. And I think, yes. you know, like, really? You know, what? yeah. what's going on there, you know? Um, so I, I, I just sort of sit back and pick my fruit and eat it and look at them, you know, <laughs> and I think they're crazy. They think I'm crazy too, but I think my crazy is better than their crazy. Yeah. And, and Thanks, Murray. We need to wind up. but Yeah, yeah. yeah. can I just quickly just add one thing? I yeah. think what, we're, what we've all been trying to say is, and I, and I, I will give you this very, very quickly, um, the main thing is that, like, and I deal with this all the time, is like getting questions. It's like every, although we live in Bendigo, um, every backyard is different, right? Mm. Uh, and everyone has different needs with their backyard. But um, if there's anything you can take away from today's uh, session, like with the with the gardening thing, is that um, know your yard, know your backyard, know what you're growing, know what you want to grow, what you want to get out of it. Mm. And uh, that is the most crucial thing is just, it's like knowing your garden like it's your best friend, like the back of your hand, you know? And that that is the key to success, I think, is just yeah. like... Know your soil. <laughs> know your soil, know your plants, know what you like to eat because a lot of people generally kind of think, oh, I'm just going to grow everything. But like, grow what you actually just right. generally eat normally. And you'll be fine, you know. That, that you, you'll never, you'll never fail with it. So yeah, it's just about like um, the backyard is not a uh, entertainment area. It is a productive, flourishing environment that mm. that you need to know just as well as your, you know, your air conditioning system. It's just as important. Yeah. And that being said, it can certainly become your happy place. You know, for me, it's my happy place. I just walk around and I watch the trees get bigger and I watch things interact and I watch the life and the birds that come to my, my yard. And I, and I can sit and look Better at it. Better than TV. You know, well, we designed our whole house so that it had a huge big glass double glazing along the back. So we sit just looking at our garden now. So it's, like, <laughs> it's my happy place. So I think everyone, I think, um, if you haven't watched the videos, get online on Facebook on Sustainable Bendigo Sustainable House Day and um, just have a look around these gardens and uh, hear what uh, Rowan is growing. You know, it's quite extraordinary, his mm -hmm. tropical garden in, in Bendigo. Um, and I think, um, Murray, have you got a quick recipe for the cider vinegar? How much? Yeah, cider yeah it was just 50 50 with water and apple cider vinegar. Okay. Um, and then you just put a few drops of detergent in there, just like, um, you know, dishwashing detergent. And what that does is when the, uh, uh, because insects are exoskeletal, if there's any oil or detergent, it gets within their skeleton, they can't breathe, it just kills them quicker. So they're not just swimming around in the, in the apple cider vinegar drowning, it just gets rid of them quicker, it kills them quick. Um, which I like, and it's easy, cheap. Just go to the go to the supermarket, buy big two liters of apple cider vinegar, fill them up half and half, a couple of drops of the detergent, hang them in the trees. Um, and Jonathan was right, you know, it never, it's not a hundred percent fail safe, um, but and you've got to get used to sharing your fruit with these little buggers. But yeah, it can be done. Yeah, and also too, if um uh yeah you're you're right yeah nothing's ever 100 percent foolproof when it comes to pesticides like you know you're preventing pests you yeah. know without yeah you know what i mean yeah. um uh but i was just going to say like if anyone does want to get in contact with me to talk about how to grow bananas in bendigo or avocados particularly 
those sorts of things that will actually grow here. Um, I, you know, I'm not spreading anything, but I'm the horticulturist at Benio Whole Foods. So I work there. If you want to just duck in the nursery and I'm usually there, you know, playing with the plants. So you can, you know, but I will leave my email if you just have any direct questions. Mm -hmm. And I am going to start a little bit of a thing of trying to, uh, I do a lot of propagation. So if anyone's after something a little bit rare, like, um, you know, black sapotis, et cetera, and all that sort of stuff, then no, yeah, gonna... come, and, come and chat to me. So yeah, <laughs> you I'm, gonna, to I'm always up for a chat. I've got an avocado in the tree that's five years old now. Um, it had its first crop three years ago. Lovely. It had about 20 avocados. And at last year, it had two. And this year is just smothered in flowers. Just yeah. smothered in flowers. I can't. I think it. it's the weather. I reckon it's the weather that's just really and, brought a lot. And of also, it's like all the. I'm looking at yours in the background there. All my leaves, where the flowers have come out, all the leaves underneath the flowers have suddenly gone yellow and looking very yeah and falling off. But they've got yeah. they've got huge flushes of bright new red ones on. That's good. Of it's the sign of a healthy avocado. Just drop the leaves. Focus on the flowers and the fruit. And again, that's my third shot at an avocado. Yeah. Nice. I just hit the sweet spot, you know? So, yeah. I mean, again, for people doing their gardening, just keep giving it a go. Try another yeah. spot. Try another thing, you know, try a different soil. <laughs> try, try something else. <laughs> that's it. Hey. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Murray. Thanks, Alyssa. Thanks, Rowan. Thanks guys. Um, yeah, lots of great information. I'm sure we could keep going if... Uh, John and I hadn't been going since 9.30 this morning. Oh. <laughs> great, great effort, Liz, honestly. Yeah. Oh, you so organizing it all. You deserve a medal. <laughs> <laughs>